Uh, we are currently in uh, a, a sermon series, in fact, we're wrapping up the sermon series today, uh, an Advent sermon series uh, that we've titled uh, The Power of a Name, all right? Names are incredibly powerful. They are meaningful. Uh, and we're looking at uh, the names of Jesus that we find in the book of Isaiah, uh, particularly verse 6. And so we've literally just been unpacking uh, name after name after name. These are uh, not just names, but they're also titles that Isaiah gives to the promised Messiah 700 years before he shows up. And, and so we've walked through each one Sunday after Sunday. And so this Sunday, we are looking at the last one. And then we're going to wrap up our sermon series. And my hope is that it would be uh, encouraging to you, uh, particularly on this day as you go back and celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just by way of reminder, I'm going to read the passage again, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in and get to work. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Hear these words of our Father. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. We pray that it would work in our very lives. Meet us where we are. We're in desperate need of a savior. His name is Jesus. And on this day, we celebrate his birth. And so we're thankful. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. So like I said, we've looked at three of these four titles that I've just read to you that Isaiah gives to us 700 years before Jesus Christ is born in a manger in Bethlehem. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. And so today we close our sermon series on Christmas day, looking at Jesus as the prince of peace. He will be named prince of peace. Now of all the titles that we have looked at, I believe this is the most fascinating one of them all. You see in the Hebrew, this name is pronounced Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. Uh, the Hebrew word sar in sar shalom is almost always a title for a prince or for one who is subordinate to a higher authority, usually the king. I want you to think a, a male member of a royal family other than the sovereign himself. And it is usually the son of the sovereign. Little side note, uh, the name Sarah, Abraham's wife, it's pronounced Sarah, and Sarah, Sarah, but Sarah means princess. Now, because of this, because Sar is, is one who's subordinate to someone who is in a position uh, higher than them, some people tend to read Sar, they tend to read prince, and think of Jesus as not one who is equal to God. Or you would remember as we've journeyed through the scriptures, particularly in the sermon series titled We Are All Theologians, where we looked at the Trinity, you would remember that, that, that Jesus is equal to God the Father and the Son in essence, in power, and in glory. And, and so if we're to think that, no, 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 because he's the prince, then he's less than, then that would be incorrect. I don't even think Isaiah wanted us to think that. In fact, this is the only place in all of scripture where the combination sar and shalom are together. And so we are to unpack it so that we might truly understand what it means and the impact it has on our lives. See, it's not to be translated like you would usually translate the word sar or prince. This child is, is not a subordinate or lesser official in the kingdom, as are all the other sars or the princes in the Old Testament. When Isaiah gives the title Sar Shalom, he's not thinking of Jesus as a subordinate God. No. Isaiah is thinking of what Jesus will usher in as the Sar Shalom, as the prince of peace, what he will bring to the world as the prince of peace. You see, to grasp the full meaning of the word 
sar, used here in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, we must unpack the word that it is connected to, shalom. See, shalom is often understood as peace, which is not incorrect. It's just not complete. See, we often think of peace as a stress-free day. Or, or maybe the absence of conflict or war. To, to some of us, it's, it's the serenity of a beautiful sunrise or sunset on a cool day. And then let's be honest, to those with little ones, peace is when the grandparents have the kids for the day. Right? Like that's peace. That's what we think. When the house is quiet. And while all of these are true, they don't fully capture shalom. Let me quote Amy Sherman, who quotes Cornelius Plantiga in a book called Kingdom Calling. Here's what she writes. Shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or sees fire among enemies. In the Bible, shalom means, hear this, universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. That's what shalom means. Shalom means, maybe to say it another way, it means completeness. Full well-being. Shalom. See, I sometimes think the word peace is far too limited. It's far too limited for us to understand shalom. Shalom is a word that really means well-being in all aspects of life. I need you to hear that. Because I think sometimes we just, we talk about the peace that the gospel brings. No, 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 listen. Shalom, shalom means well-being in all aspects of life. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. All of them. If this was an exam, it would be all of the above. E, I choose E, all of the above. See, when Jewish people, and still today, when they greet one another with the word shalom, it wasn't, hey, just have a nice day. That's not what they mean, you know, shalom. Oh, just have a, hope you have a good day today. No. What they were saying is that, may all that you need for your well-being today come to you today. All that you need. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, everything that you need, may it come to you today. That's shalom. This child is the official, the authority, the one in charge of all shalom. He is Sar Shalom, the prince of peace, the, the prince of wholeness, the prince of all well being. This is no small thing. No small thing. And so if you really want shalom, if you want shalom, if you want this, this peace, this wholeness, this completeness, then you must come to him. You must come to him. Maybe it's someone asking for directions to where Rooted Fellowship is. Just quickly, location. If you really want shalom, then you must come to him. You must come to the Prince of Peace. For he is the only one divinely ordained to give it. He is the only one. The only one. That is why Isaiah gives him this title, gives him this name. Because he recognizes there is one who is coming 700 years before Jesus shows up. He's like, there's one who's coming who will be divinely ordained to give this well-being. True shalom comes from God and is only found in God. And Jesus is the one who makes all this possible by granting us peace with God. You see, before you cross the line of faith, before you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are at war with God. You are at war with God. And you're like, but I'm not at war, I'm a good person. Really? In comparison to who? Too many of us, what we do is we tend to co compare our goodness to, to the, the criminal in prison who's got a life sentence. 
No, 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 you don't even have to go that far. None of us are good. None of us. And before we have an encounter with Jesus, all of us are at war with God. This is why the Prince of Peace had to come and step in the gap and go, okay, listen, let me make a way. Let me make a way. And so the only way to God is through the Prince of Peace. See, experiencing shalom in all facets of life begins with experiencing shalom with God. Before we talk about the physical and the mental and the emotional and like all that other stuff, we need to go and hold on. Before we get there, are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with God? It all starts with shalom with God. It begins with the individual human heart being reconciled to God through Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Friends, this is, this is why we do this week in, week out. It's, like it's one of the many reasons that we gather is, is to plead with you, to say, listen, you, you are in desperate need of peace. Peace with God. And that is only possible through the Prince of Peace, the one who is divinely ordained to give it. See, the Greek word for peace in the New Testament is, is irini, and it means the same thing as shalom. So when you read peace in the New Testament and read it in the Old Testament, it's saying the same thing. We can only experience peace if we have peace with God. This is why Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified, 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 this simply means to be made right with God. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once an individual has peace with God, then the peace given to them by God will be able to flow through the rest of their lives. That's how it works. Because God is is both the giver and the sustainer of the peace. I think some of us, we tend to think, you know what? Yes, I'm right with God, but now I'm going to go to all these other things hoping to find peace. He is both the giver and the sustainer of it. And Jesus is the means by which any of this can happen. No self-help book, no popular podcast, not even the best therapist. And hear me, friends, I am not against therapy. I am all for it, all for it. Many of us in here need to go see some good, godly therapists. I'm all for it. But it cannot, it cannot, cannot, cannot give you what Jesus can give you. Cannot. Why? Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. I mean, again, I've said this before, but this should blow our mind. All of God, all of God, in Jesus. And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making what? By making what? Peace Peace through his blood shed on the cross. You cannot, you cannot experience peace separated from Jesus. You just simply cannot. And we try. We try. And the Bible tells us you cannot. See, when Jesus said, without me you can do nothing, in John 15, verse 5, he really meant it. Like, we should take Jesus for his word. He really, you can do nothing apart from me. Friends, this includes shalom. I, I think many of us, we, we, we do this. We go, we go, okay, I definitely need Jesus for this, for this, and for this. But you know what? Stay out of my finances. Stay out of my relationships. Stay out of my sexuality. And then you're going, but why is it not flourishing? Why am I not experiencing peace here? Because he, he's already told us, apart from him, apart from him, nothing, including shalom. No effort toward well-being is accomplished without the express authority of Jesus. That he sits on his throne as the prince, and he goes, okay, I grant it. I grant it. So will you come to him to receive it? All that you and I need is Jesus. This is why we celebrate the birth of Christ, recognizing that that when Jesus came, he he ushered in peace. I want us to take a look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. We've been in uh, chapter, verse 6, 
Isaiah chapter nine, verse seven. Yes, we've been in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six throughout this sermon series, but, but, but there's some, some beautiful things happening in verse seven here. It says here uh, in the CSB translation, the one that I predominantly preach out of, it says the dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. This word prosperity in the Hebrew is shalom. So, so included in what shalom means is prosperity. So you want prosperity? You need shalom. The New Living Translation says it this way. It makes it plain. His government and its peace will never end. Will never end. Jesus is the authority of peace. He he just is. But you might be sitting here going, what does this old prophet know? 700 years before Jesus shows up. Like what what is your, how how do we know? How do we know? Okay. Okay. Okay, then let's jump over to the New Testament. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 33 to 31. This is the announcement of Jesus' birth. Now listen, you will conceive, Mary, and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This sounds familiar? Because it, it literally comes out of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Let me read it to you. The dominion will be vast. And its prosperity, its peace, its shalom will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now on and forever the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish it. At Jesus' very birth, right? I just read to you before he was born, but at his very birth, the, the announcement, the announcement is this, peace has arrived. Luke chapter two, verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. At Jesus' birth, turmoil, war, division, Frustration, anxiety, fear, all of it trembled. It all trembled because it recognized who showed up. The Prince of Peace. That that all the the power that we had, no, 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 guys, it's, it's coming to an end because peace has arrived. In John 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's talking to them about his imminent departure. And there's a lot lot happening in John 14. I'd encourage you to go read it at some point. It's an incredible, incredible chapter. He he talks to them about the way to the Father and how to get there. He says, it's only through me. He also talks about prayer. He makes the promise of the Holy Spirit who will come. And if you look closely enough, he even drops the doctrine of the Trinity. But you gotta look close. It's there. He says a lot in this chapter. And then... He speaks of peace. In verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled or fearful. He he says a lot, and then right at the end, he goes, And peace I give to you. Because that's what you need. If you're going to navigate through this life, if you're going to make it, you need peace. And not just any peace, but peace that comes from Jesus. And in verse 27 of John 15, Jesus makes direct mention of fear. I love that. He makes direct mention of fear. With his peace, there is no reason for fear. No reason. Which should beg the question, if you are living a life of fear, have you? received peace? Are you anchored in peace? Are you living in peace? Jesus says to his disciples that they don't have to live a life of fear because of all that Jesus has done for them and will continue to do for them in the future, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And what he says to them, he says to us, Now, there are a lot of places that we can go. In preparation, 
of this sermon. There was like a lot of places that we can go to actually see Jesus operating, not just as the Prince of Peace, but also giving peace. Tons of places in the scriptures. I mean, we can, we can go for the demon-possessed woman liberated from her turmoil. The Samaritan woman at the well. That's also a moment where the Prince of Peace engages. Because she's at the well at a time where that's not when you go get water. Why? Because she's like, I'm at odds with everyone else in my town. We could go to Zacchaeus. I mean, he, he is just wrestling. He's wrestling so much that he's like, you know what? I'm willing, I'm willing to climb this tree just to, just to get a glimpse. My, my heart is burdened. I, just, I, I know I'm doing wrong, but I, I, I just don't know what it is. I, I need peace. We could go to the woman who bled for 12 years. I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine that. In a society where... where, where you bleeding, is, you're considered unclean, and so no one can be around you. So she was lonely, isolated, embarrassed. And she goes, you know what, I hear the Prince of Peace is in town. You know what, I don't care what people think of me. I want to go meet him. I want a life of peace. We could go to, to the paralyzed man. We could, we could go to the blind man. There's so many places that we could go where we see the Prince of Peace in action. But for the sake of time, I'll go to one, one of my favorite. It's Mark chapter four. And here's the thing. I know that oftentimes, right, when, when we read the Bible, we tend to read it kind of in a systematic way. So we just go, you know what, I'm, it's only speaking of peace when I see peace here happening and so therefore nowhere else. No, 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 no. If we understand that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, then everywhere he goes, he's ushering in shalom. And so every encounter, You've got to have your eyes open to go, okay, I see what's happening here. I know he's unpacking this uh, doctrine, this theological, beautiful thing. This, okay, but, but also he's offering peace. He's offering peace. And so Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. I'm going to move through this real quick. Jesus is with his disciples. As you know, doing a ton of ministry. And now he says, you know what, guys, let's get on a boat. Let's get on the Sea of Galilee and let's go into the other side. I'll read from verse 36. And leaving the crowd, they took him, this is Jesus, with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. Verse 37, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Now you can imagine the panic, because we're going to see it here in a moment. The panic. They're, they're, they're on the water's the wind is blowing, the waves, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so they panic. But, but, but if we go back to verse 35, look at what it says. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. D don't miss it. Jesus says to them, let us go to the other side. First and foremost, the fact that Jesus would pick them, that he would pick them to be his disciples, that, that's not just being picked last on the team. That's like, you know, when the person's picking players, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, I used to witness it, never happened to, to me. I was generally picked, you know, first or third, uh, second sometimes, but I don't know. But, but no, it, it's not even being picked last. It's, it's when someone looks and goes, hey, we, do, do you mind maybe carrying water for us? Like, that's what it should have been like, but yet Jesus doesn't. He goes, you know what, I'll take you, 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 I'll take you. And you're just going, wait, you're picking me? Yes, I pick you. And, and then he says, let us go to the other side. What do you have to fear? If one, Jesus is the one telling you to go, and then on top of that, he's with you. It shouldn't matter what you face. You're just like, you know what, I got picked, and he's with me. And he's already told, I mean, there's, there's so many pieces of scripture where we're not told where we're going, right? He'll, God will just say, pack up your bags, let's go. Where are we going? None of your business, let's go. It's, and he can do that. Why? Because he's God. But, but here he goes, let us go. Where? To the other side. That should tell us that, hey, we're going to make it. Regardless of what we experience, we are going to make it because he is with us. 
Oh, this is so many implications for our lives. Because, because you have to ask the question, if I'm in a boat, and you're gonna see the panic in a moment, I'm in a boat and, and things are going crazy, and I look, and, and Jesus is not in the boat, then did Jesus really tell you to go? <laughs> I, I mean, let's be honest. Let's be honest. So many of us, we have our own plans and our own ambitions, and then we slap Jesus' name there at the bottom, and then we go, okay, cool, I'm going. And then when things don't go your way, you're like, Jesus, where are you? Jesus is still on the shore going, where are you going? Where are you going? Let us go. Friends, if Jesus is with you, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing. The Prince of Peace is with you. But then a great windstorm arose. It's waves and it's chaos. And, it's, and this is no small, stone, uh, small storm because, I mean, you remember, Jesus, some of Jesus' disciples were, were fishermen. So they, they knew the waters. They knew storms. But they were just going, this is, this is something unreal now. Verse 38, but he was in the stern, this is the back of the boat, asleep on the cushion. Oh, I love that. Huh? It's crazy. Where is Jesus? And, and at the back, with a cushion, with a pillow. Now, I, 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 I don't know how Jesus would have slept. I don't know what your style is when you're comfortable. I don't know if you're like, like, like this or, 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 or hugging it. I don't, but what we know is that Jesus was comfortable. He was comfortable. Because he's the prince of peace. There's chaos happening, but you're like, I, I, I'm the prince of peace. This doesn't bother me. Now we'll see in a moment what does bother him. But the waves, the water, the, the, the clouds, the lightning, the th- no, he is fast asleep while everyone else, you and me, were panicking. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, listen to this. Do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? I mean, and it happens to all of us. All of us, when we take our eyes off the Prince of Peace and, and we, we fix them on the water, the wind, the clouds, the lightning, the, we start making accusations to God. We look to the heavens and we're like, how dare you? This is why the writer of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, the Prince of Peace. Keep, have they just kept their eyes on Jesus and gone, if he's sleeping... Remember, he's already told us, let us go to the other side. If he's sleeping, ah, then where's my pillow? (laughs) But no, we're we're waking him up and then we're saying, do you you not care? You don't care? Friends, this is a dangerous place to be. And the enemy, the enemy will always attack here first. This, This is why scripture tells us, Paul writes it in Romans, he says, renew your mind. Because that's where he's coming. He's coming here. He's coming here and he's going to say, he's going to say things to you that, that make you question, that keep you up late at night. And, so, and what happens? What happens if you don't take these captive? They make their way here. Now you're all emotional. And you're like, well, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What's my plan? Where am I going to go? And then you what? You act. Verse 39, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace. Now, this word peace is not, is not shalom. Just want to make sure. It's not. It's not. But it simply means silence. Silence. Be still. Can you imagine that? Like he's waking up and he's just like, okay, accusations here. You don't love us. You don't care. Look at, look at them on Instagram. They're flourishing. What about me? You know, and, and, and he's like, Silence. (laughs) And the wind ceased. And there was great calm. How many of you today need great calm in your life? Hmm? And whatever circumstance or situation you're in, you, you know, you know you need great calm. It's just chaos in your life. And, and maybe just today, you've managed to put yourself together just, just for, for, for 90 minutes, 95 minutes, 
<laughs> and as soon as you get in your car and you go home, you fall apart. And here we're told that the Prince of Peace can look at whatever you're going through and just go silence. Silence. Verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? The the thing that bothered Jesus was not the waters, was not the wind, was not the lightning, was not the chaos. What bothered him was their lack of faith. I want you to think about that for a moment. We're all concerned on what's going on. And he's going, hey, your your attention is is in the wrong place. Your, your, Your focus is in the wrong place. Have you still no faith? And then we're told, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Who is he? Well, Isaiah's been telling us these last couple of weeks. He is the wonderful counselor. The Peleuet. He is the mighty God, the El Gabor. He is the everlasting father, the Aviat. He is the prince of peace. That's who he is. That's why when you are with him, you go, man, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. Sickness, pain, like financial calamity, like it, it doesn't, and we pray for those things. I want you to know that. We pray, we pray shalom over those things. But I want you to know that even if those things don't go the way that you want them to go, I still have Jesus. I still have the Prince of Peace with me. And if you look at the text real quick, we see three greats here. We see a great windstorm in verse 37. We see a great calm in verse 39. And then we see a great fear in verse 41. Now, Oni, I thought you said fear is something that we should not have. No, 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 you shouldn't. But the only fear that you should have is the fear of the Lord. That's, that's the only fear that the church and Christians should have is a fear of the Lord. Because, because Proverbs 9, 10 tells us that, 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 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Therefore, a person... A people, a church, a nation with no fear of the Lord is foolish. Foolish. And it's not, it, that's what the Bible says. So there's a great windstorm, a great calm, and a great fear. You have a great windstorm in your life, and you, you need great calm, then you need to have great fear for the Lord. That's the only way that it works. And so if you are not in awe of who he is, the prince of peace, you will live in chaos for the rest of your life. I I mean, I'm telling you, the church needs to hear this because so often we put our hope, we anchor everything into the constitution, into politicians, into business leaders. And look, man, we hold them accountable, but hear me, a nation will not change if the church does not rise and go, you know what, we have fear. For the Lord himself, the Prince of Peace. And so will we be that church? Will we be that church? But to be that church, the big question is, will you put your trust in the Prince of Peace? That's my question to all of you today. Is will you put your trust in the Prince of Peace? And if you want peace, you need proximity. You cannot experience peace if you are not close to Jesus. And not just close, but surrendering your life to him as Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, all of us want peace. We're going to get in our cars and we're going to want it. We're going to be frustrated by what we read on the news. We're going to be frustrated next week. We're going to be like, I just can't take this anymore. And it's like, well, then go be with Jesus. Go be with Jesus. If you want peace, you need proximity. That only happens by dying to self and surrendering to the Savior. And so this Sunday, this Christmas, my hope is that you would hear the invitation and accept it. The gospel is not just information, but it's also an invitation. And so there's two groups of people that I'm gonna pray for. I'm gonna ask the band to come back up and close this out in song. But I'm gonna pray for two groups of people. The first group of people is for folks who, you're hearing this and and I get it, right? Like we, we live in a 
Christian nation. Just for the audio, I, I, did, I did, what do you call these things? It's, yeah, 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 it means like it's not real. I know that. And so many of us would go, you know what, I've heard some version of this. I've heard the name Jesus. I think I'm good. And then it's like, but, but, but if, you, if you unpack that, if you double click that, why, why would you say you're good? Well, I, I, grew up, I grew up going to church. My parents are Christian. I go to a, a group every week. Friends, those things are amazing things and, and are grace, grace from God himself. But, but hear me, the, the only way, the only way that you can have peace with God is through Jesus. It's by surrendering your life to him. It's by simply saying, I need you. Here's another way. God, I need a favor. I need a favor. It's the one prayer that I know with certainty God will answer every single time. I need you. And so this is an opportunity for you. I'm gonna pray. There's an opportunity for you to surrender your life to him. To actually go, you know what? It's, it's, not, it's not about the fact that I go to church on a Sunday or that I grew up in a Christian home. or, or These are all good things. It's, it's, not, it's about having a relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna pray that you would experience the Prince of Peace. The second group of people I'm gonna pray for is for those who've crossed the line of faith. That's how we say it here at Fellowship. You've been walking with Jesus for a while. He is your Lord and Savior. But for some reason, as the writer of Hebrews says, that you've drifted. You've taken your eyes off Jesus and, and you've now fixed them on the chaos. And, and so now, now you're scrambling. You're on the internet trying to figure out where's the best place to immigrate. And, and, and hear me, I am not against immigration. If Jesus tells you to do it, then by all means. I'm not against relocation. If Jesus tells you, then by all means. But there are jobs that you are in, places that you are living, where God is going, what are you doing there? And you go, it's just chaos. It's just, I, I'm in turmoil. I'm, I'm, he's like, what are you doing there? This is not how it works. You don't, you don't come up with your own plans and then go, like, it's like forging Jesus' signature on it and then going to everyone, like, you see, he said, God said. And so I wanna, I wanna pray f- for you. If you're experiencing this turmoil, this frustration, this chaos, God loves you. And just because you might have drifted, he can bring you back. He is that powerful. He loves you, loves you more than you could ever imagine. He wants to restore this relationship with you. But it's gonna require you to surrender. To go, you know what, I'm actually not in control of my own life. I'm not the master of my own destiny. Jesus is. The Sar Shalom. And so Father God, praying now that you would Meet us all where we are. God, there are folks in this room who have not surrendered their lives to Jesus. If that's you, I pray just in this moment now that you would, you would just, just open yourself up to him. He wants the relationship with you. He loves you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And if you, if you doubt that, we look to the finished work on the cross. He died for you. So I pray that today would be the day that you receive the greatest gift ever given. That on Christmas Day, you're receiving the best gift that anyone could receive, and that is Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace. And that the peace that surpasses all understanding, you'd experience that today. I pray that for you. And Lord, I pray for those who they have walked in here and they're just wrestling with a lot. They're worried, worried about their kids, about family members, about friends, about colleagues, worried about their job, worried about their next paycheck, worried about this country, worried about where it's going politically, economically, worried about their safety. That it fills us with fear. God, I pray that we would let go and trust you. Let go and trust you. You are in control of all of our lives, our kids, our work life, our friendships, our relationships, all of it. You're in charge of all of it. And so God, I I pray now that today would be an opportunity for us just to say yes to you again, to take our eyes off the storm and to fix them on you. 
We love you, Lord. We praise you. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.